opinions expressed on this program are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. BronxNet. Your voice, your views, your vision. Good evening, I am Eric Schneer, Bronx Lebanon Hospital Center's Vice President of Planning, Marketing, and Public Relations, your co-host for tonight's Health Beat television program. We welcome you, our many viewers, and also encourage you to continue participating in the program by calling 718-960-7241 with any questions you may have. That's 718-960-7241. And as always, we promise to do our very best to keep you medically informed and healthy by discussing the medical topics that are of interest to you. Please tune in every Monday evening from 6.30 to 7 p.m. on Channel 67. And you can also find out more information about Bronx Lebanon and its many community services online at our website, bronxcare.org. Tonight, my co-host, Dr. Milton Gums, Bronx Lebanon's Vice President, and medical director and I will be discussing obesity in children and teenagers, a topic that is certainly of increasing concern in our Bronx community and throughout the nation. Joining us this evening are two experts in the field. Dr. Manta Reddy is a highly regarded pediatrician at Bronx Lebanon Hospital Center. She is also a key contributor and driving force in Bronx Lebanon's many children health initiatives for the community. Ms. Shaina is the project manager for Bronx Lebanon Childhood Obesity Prevention Program. She is also a registered dietitian with extensive academic experience in the field. Now before we hear from both of you, our panelists, let me once again encourage you, our viewers, to call in with any questions or comments you may have. The number to call is 718-960-7241. That's 718-960-7241. 9607241 and please call us. Now let me begin the program by asking each of our panelists and I'll start with you Dr. Reddy to give us your perspective on the childhood obesity problem in America and for that matter in our Bronx community. Sure. So childhood obesity has been a growing problem since the 1980s and right. in the last 5 years the problem's almost tripled. Here in the South Bronx, we say out of every 3 children in a Head Start program, one of them is overweight and half of them are obese. So it's a, it's a big problem and something that really needs to be addressed. Now, Mishana, what about you? What's your perspective on the problem? Well, also since the 80s, times have changed and the parents aren't cooking home meals anymore. They're right. resorting to fast food, packaged meals, kids are eating out and they're not as physically active as they were. And thanks to technology, even four-year-olds have iPhones in their hand. Forget about video games that keep them engaged in screen time and less activity time. Well, hopefully their iPhones will give them good nutrition tips as well. <laughs> At what age do experts such as yourself consider the beginning point for childhood obesity? In other words, what are the specific signs we're looking for you're talking about the 80s. I don't remember the 80s. I was working mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. I was active. So the trends have gotten younger and younger, and we can trace the beginning of obesity to as young as two years of age, and maybe even as young as two months of age. So that really tells us how important it is to incorporate early healthy habits before the baby's even eating food. But clearly, clearly it's not the baby's fault. It's the parent's activities that we need to focus on tonight, right? So there's a lot that goes on yeah. with that. I mean, a big part of it is healthy lifestyles and habits that yeah. get blended into a family's lifestyles. It's not just about one individual or one member of the family. It's the family as a whole. So we have to do those activities early with the family, and the parents play a big part in that. Yeah. You want to tell us about some of the activities? Or? Well, there's a lot of practices that they want to avoid and they also want to engage in. One of the practices to avoid is feeding rice cereal in baby bottles when the baby is an infant. Also, um, breastfeeding is best to help prevent 
obesity. Also being active with the baby, playing with them, having tummy time, keeping them active, not laying in the playpen all day. Well, going back to the pediatric uh, aspect, Dr. Reddy, how do pediatric uh, specialists such as yourself monitor a baby's growth, and what are the so-called norms that you're looking for as the baby grows? Yeah, it's an important question because often we judge a baby's growth on being a happy, healthy, chubby baby, but until you actually know how to compare your baby to other babies on a growth chart, it becomes really tricky to know how healthy your baby is. So we want to look at um, trends on a baby's growth chart for where they start to the trend of how they grow right. and to stay at a certain growth pattern. So it's easy to expect good growth for a baby who's eating well and growing well, we expect them to gain weight, but there's a certain amount of weight that's expected to be normal weight gain. And what is that by age, let's say, like a year old, for example? So it's actually really hard to judge exactly by right. age, and every baby should keep on a certain trend, and that's what's important to be talking to your pediatrician about, to be monitoring that and asking that question, because mm. it's not where you start and where you end up, it's the trend that goes on between these points. I see. But I get a feeling that most parents take their children to the pediatrician. So are we going to take a little bit of the blame for the obesity or it's all the parents, it's all the diet? Okay, don't answer that. <laughs> yet. Um, how would you describe the recommended course of action once a parent has been informed that their child is obese? What happens? There? Good. I think that's an important first step yeah. to just know that there's a problem and yeah. to know where you stand on that growth chart because a lot of good counseling can happen but parents have to be receptive, ask the questions, have the conversation going back and forth on what things they can change and modify in their lifestyle and their dietary habits at home because what they're doing at home is what the child's learning to carry on for themselves down the road. Yeah. Now, what about diabetes? We've heard a lot about diabetes for adults. How does diabetes, uh, particularly type 2 diabetes, impact on uh, children and obesity? Sure, we used to Is talk... Is there a connection? Absolutely. In fact, you know, we, we talk about type 1 diabetes as being juvenile onset, the type that requires insulin, and then right. type 2 diabetes is what we consider adult onset, and that's usually modified by lifestyle and behavior. But as children are becoming more obese, there tends to be more type 2 diabetes in children as well. So that's a growing problem. We used to not see type 2 diabetes in children, but as lifestyles modify, behavior modifies, then that impacts the obese child as well. I guess my question is coming back to what I said before. What are the specific actions that parents can do to prevent obesity in their children? You have a baby, everyone loves yeah. the baby. Everyone is trying to breastfeed the baby or give the baby something that makes the baby chubby. Mm -hmm. What should the parent know? Your question. question. And you can show off your words <laughs> in front of you. What should the parent know? The parent should be informed and also know who's watching their child and let the caretaker know, I don't want my child having any juice or having any sugary sweetened beverages. And I mentioned juice mm. because it's actually a big contributor to childhood obesity yeah. because people are mi misinformed. Yeah. You get a lot of free juice from WIC and whatnot, but let's take an example. Here's Welch's 100% grape juice. That's the first thing you want to look at when you're picking out a juice for your child. And you really want to make sure you're only giving them four ounces and you want to dilute it with water. Why? Because if you look on the back, there's 36 grams of sugar in eight ounces. That's a lot of sugar. Actually, if you put that much in a baby bottle, that's how much sugar you're giving them. I know we have the camera focusing on yeah. mm -hmm. the other way. Sugar. Yeah. It, like that, lift it up, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a lot. That's what, what, are the, what are those packages there? These packets, yeah. these are all the sugar in the whole bottle. Yeah. So if they're giving the baby this, that's a lot of sugar. So you want Just to- Just Albert is ready to take you on. Albert, you have a question for us? Yes, I do. Um, Albert. Yes, my, my question is at, at what at what age is it appropriate to make a child obese? Is that a good idea? What happened to Albert? Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead. In this whole entire yes, bottle. Uh, uh, my, my question is at 
Is it, is it a good time? Or is it appropriate to maybe get the child on diet pills? Would that that's something that would help or make it worse? So what is the good time for to introduce something like that? Albert is asking: Is it when is a good time to get the baby started on diet pills? I would think that it's probably better to prevent that, right? You never so, want. I know, but we are trying to. We're trying to avoid that. That's the, that's the emphasis of tonight, right? So there are a, a lot of counseling things yeah. that we can go through, a lot of education that can be done. Thanks for the question, Alvin. So we would hope that there are a lot of interventions you can do at home on a day-to-day -day basis, how you shop, how you cook, um, watching portion sizes with your baby, with yeah. your growing child. Yeah. Those are all things that can be incorporated and be teaching the child these healthy healthy things to be doing yeah. that could probably avoid having to take medication intervention that could potentially have other side effects and yeah. other bad things that could happen yeah. as a result of it. But so much we can do by having a conversation with your pediatrician and asking those kinds of questions so that you can be informed of all that you can do at home on a day-to-day -day basis yeah. to improve the lifestyle of how, how, you, how you are day to day. Well, I just want everyone to know that it's not as easy as you, you all make it. I have a <laughs> grandson who was a little chubby, and yesterday he was having lunch with us, and there were three of us mm -hmm. who were telling him, cut it down, stop it, and he was still fighting to eat. So mm -hmm. it's, I recognize that it's a difficult problem. We talk about it, but we know that the, pa the parents are struggling. We have a question. Sue, you're on the air. Yes, hi. I have a question. I know you guys Sue? are talking about... Yes? You have a question Hello? for us? Yes. I was wondering um, if any of um, the doctors have seen any problems with children um, moving from, from being anorexic, from being um, obese to being anorexic, you know, to the, the models on TV and things like that. Um, are you kind of dealing with that, or is it not much of a problem anymore? You heard the question? The other side of the equation. The anorexia, anorexia and diabetes. Or anorexia obesity. And, obesity? And, and obesity, yeah. Uh -huh. So we talk a lot about the influence of the media on how children cho make choices and healthy choices at that. So I would actually, I feel like I see more of a problem with the obesity than yeah. I do with anorexia at that yeah. point. But you know, I think it depends on which age range of kids you're talking about also. I mean, younger and younger children are being exposed to more more things than they were before. But, you know, probably, you know, a teenage girl is more likely to be influenced by, you know, uh, movie star models mm -hmm. and, and media that they might be exposed so to. So how do we address that problem? I think that was the I essence think it's of an the important, question. I think it's important to have a lot of conversation and be talking about what's considered a a healthy role model and you know I think parents also see these same people as role models mm -hmm. and you know so to have the conversations of what's on the, what's in the movies and what's on TV and what's real life and what you consider healthy yeah. and um, to you know really talk about you know the lifestyles and the health aspects of these things too. Thanks for the question Sue. Okay, okay. now, now Wait, per yeah. perhaps uh, what I wanted to ask was uh, the question tied into what is your program right now and how can people in our community get the counseling that you just described? Is there a number they can call and perhaps you can share with our viewers the types of uh, programs that are out there for them from Bronx, Lebanon? So if you don't have a pediatrician, you definitely need a pediatrician to be right. talking about these things. Um, you know, every child requires an annual health physical exam, but that's mostly a form that you're filling out and some routine things that you right. go through. Um, but, you know, it's important to ask the questions that, um, that are important to you. And if you talk to your pediatrician, you get some initial counseling. And if it's something that's of interest to you, you should ask for a referral to see a registered dietitian, mm -hmm. such as Ms. Shiner, who can sit down with you and go through a lot of important skills and strategies, techniques, mm -hmm. things to avoid, things to look for, how to read a food label, and yeah. really how to shop for food that can be healthy for not just you and your child, but your whole family. Yeah. So um, if you need a pediatrician, you should be reaching out. Well, most um, people probably have a pediatrician. You I want a pediatrician, but yeah. you want a pediatrician that you can ask the questions you want answered yes, too. Yeah. So if you're not getting yeah. what you want yeah. from your pediatrician, um, yeah. I work with a lot of wonderful pediatricians. 
um, you can call 99 Bronx to make an appointment yeah. and your pediatrician can help arrange for a referral to see a dietitian to get some um, up-to-date information and keep you up with what you need to know. Okay, on that note, let's pause for a short break and when we return we will continue our discussion as well as also take calls from you, our viewers. Once again, the number to call is 718-960-7241. That's 718-960-7241. And please call us. Bronx Lebanon surgeons are experts in the field, bringing a diversity of skills and cutting-edge operative procedures to their patients. But what is most important about our Bronx Lebanon surgeons is that they are responding to many difficult challenges and saving lives. Nurses at Bronx Lebanon are also an integral part of the OR team. We work with the surgeons in the operating and recovery rooms and are at the patient's bedside providing the necessary support and compassionate care. In the ICU, our critical care specialists evaluate, treat, and monitor patients until they're strong enough to be transferred to a med surge floor. Sometimes surgical measures are necessary to breathe life back into patients, and ear, nose, and throat surgeons are called into action. Bronx Lebanon's oral and maxiofacial specialists are widely acknowledged for their expertise in all types of dental surgery. From tooth extractions under intravenous sedation, the emergency treatment of facial injuries, to innovative implant procedures, we are clearly placing smiles for miles in the Bronx. Bronx Lebanon is also leading the way in cardiology, dermatology, internal medicine, infectious diseases, neonatology, nephrology, neurology, pediatrics, family medicine, pathology, psychiatry, and radiology. And its Bronx Care Network, including the soon-to-be-completed ambulatory care facility, is fulfilling the hospital's essential role as doctor to the community. Welcome back to HealthBeat. We come to you live on BronxNet every Monday evening from 6.30 to 7 p.m. Please call us at 718-960-7241 with any questions you may have. And we will certainly do our best to answer them. That's 718-960-7241. Now let's continue our discussion. A question we often ask our panelists is to share their respective backgrounds with our viewers, as well as also tell our viewers what got them interested in the field itself. And let me start with you, Dr. Reddy. Okay. So after medical school, I did a training in pediatrics, and um, I did some extra training to be a specialist in allergy immunology. Right. So I predominantly take care of patients with asthma, but as a pediatrician, I become very interested in other health conditions because right. in order to take care of a chronic disease like asthma, there has to be general wellness too. So much of that includes just how healthy a child is. And a big problem has become childhood obesity in that patients with asthma who are also obese have a harder time managing their asthma. So that's where my interest has come from for this particular program. Right, okay. And Ms. Shiner, how about you? What got you interested in this field? I always actually battled weight problems ever since I was a young girl. And my first bachelor's was in media and communications, and I actually wanted to be a health writer. But then right. once I graduated, I realized that I needed an RD credential. So I decided to go into the field of healthcare and help other people battle the, wealth, the weight problems and further my education with nutrition. Okay. So you want to, you want to talk to us about that question that you're talking about, the <laughs> obesity and anorexia? Obesity and anorexia, even bulimia too, any type of eating disorder, it's a big concern because everybody's focusing on obesity and not being fat when it's really, you just want to be healthy. You want to focus on healthy habits, healthy lifestyles. Just don't worry about being, because if, even if you're too skinny, it's not healthy either. So yeah. you want to be a good weight, like Dr. Reddy said before, look at good role models and not focus on the fat, but more of the health. Okay. No, so let me get now. What about where do you stand on breastfeeding? Is that an important attribute for the mother? It's how we're built. Yes, I. <laughs> <laughs> we're made. We're born to breastfeed, and it's the sole source of nutrition that a baby should receive. So yes, I. For how long? About four to six months exclusively, but they want to breastfeed for the first year. 
Right. From the perspective of the immune system, the most important breast milk to get is in the first two weeks. It's what we call colostrum. Right. So it's the richest, most nutrient part of breast milk. So yeah. getting that actually helps a lot with fighting infections and um, empowering your immune system with antibodies. So the first two weeks are what most important. Recommendations are to breastfeed for up to a year. But we know there's a lot of controversy in breastfeeding itself in yeah. that working mothers, it yeah. sometimes doesn't seem natural. Um, and you know, there are things that a working mother can do also. She can, Pumping and all of can that pump as well. Yeah. But there's actually something about breastfeeding itself that breastfed babies tend to be less obese. Um, probably because a mother actually picks up on the cues of how full a baby is yeah. by breastfeeding as opposed to even breast milk in a bottle. Mm -hmm. So that's where this link between breastfed babies and less obesity is coming into play. Okay. So it aside... It's like a turnaround because... It is, yeah. it is. So aside from, I mean, it used to be we would talk about the nutrition and the antibodies of yeah. breastfeeding, but it's actually shifted mm -hmm. a lot that it's not just about the content of the breast milk, it's actually yeah. about the the activities that go mm -hmm. on around yeah. it and how it applies. It, it, it uh, expanding on Dr. Gums's question, Mishana, is there a time to introduce solid foods into the baby's diet? And yeah. what types of solid foods uh, are we talking about? Yes, you want to introduce solid foods when the baby's physically ready. And what I mean by that is they're able to sit up, keep their head up, chew and swallow, they have teeth. It's about four to six months is when you start introducing, when they are physically ready. And you want to start with rice cereal first, but you don't want to introduce it in the bottle. You want to mix it with a little formula if you're formula feeding, or a little breast milk in a bowl, and feed the baby that at first. And when you introduce a particular food, you want to wait about three days to make sure there aren't any adverse reactions, the baby's tolerating, their stomach's okay with it. Um, so from an allergist perspective, you want to take your time to make sure that the baby is tolerating food. You want to get food. your woods in there, right? mm -hmm. <laughs> now, Before you move on. <laughs> what types of adverse reactions could we be talking about? So the most common reactions are just a GI intolerance, that the baby's just not comfortable with the food. So it doesn't necessarily have to be vomiting or diarrhea or anything overt, right. but just a tolerance of the food. Now, of course, most foods hopefully are well tolerated as long as you space them out, but we also become concerned about rashes and swelling, the actual right. anaphylactic reactions that could be very scary and dangerous. Right. I'm going back to you now, so you can have a few minutes mm -hmm. to tell us a little bit like what are some of the recommendations that our viewers should keep in mind when purchasing food? Should parents read what on the label? Should, what should, should they read? Well, Not on the question. label, I'll just grab mine here. You want to look at calories, but more importantly, you want to know where the calories come from. So the total amount of fat, you don't want to buy anything with trans fat, but the companies are sneaky and they can put no trans fat and there's still a half a gram in a serving. Yeah. You want to look for sugars and the carbs, make sure that it's not high in sugar. And look What's at high in sugar means? Usually anything more than five grams of sugar. So you want to keep, you know, five grams of sugar, the total grams of fat, about three grams of fat for every hundred calories in a yeah. serving. Sodium too, you don't want a product high in sodium, it should be about the same or less than the amount of calories in the product. So that bottle should be made twice as large, should be diluted? Mm -hmm. This should be half the size, actually a quarter of the size. Yeah. Juice should be in four ounce servings, not okay. eight ounce servings, and the four ounces of juice should be diluted. That yes. bottle's 14 yeah. ounces, yes. so it's three it's times the serving. Yeah, yeah. Even the adults yeah. shouldn't be drinking that problem, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. right? Now, yeah. another question that we often... Everyone is moving on. <laughs> well, I wanted to, to give them a chance to really okay. share with our viewers their success stories. Uh, and I'll start with you, Dr. Reddy. Can you share with our viewers some of your patient's successes? Sure. A patient who listens to you. A patient who follows instructions. <laughs> so, um, it's, it's a challenge, but as a, as, a, as a physician that I see patients with asthma, I can tell you a story of a preschool child who was obese with asthma and was having a lot of difficulty with exercising and even playing at the playground. That's exercise for a five-year-old. Um, but a lot of problems with the asthma could actually be attributed to just deconditioning from the obesity. So by meeting with a registered dietitian and getting the family on a healthier plan made the family healthier. It took some time, but with some good lifestyle changes and habits incorporated in, um, if the child could 
to become a normal body weight to go on to improve their asthma control as well. So to me, that was rewarding. That's good, that's good, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. And how about you, Michelle? Any success that comes to your mind that would be a, a, a good example for our viewers? I actually had a parent come in. She's a mother of a five-year-old, and she would tell me what she would give him for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and actually showed me a picture, took a picture of his meal, oh. and I pointed to what was wrong and what was good about the meal. When she came back for a follow-up, she took another picture and she actually listened to me and she completely changed the whole entire plate and switched her white pasta for whole wheat, kept broccoli and shrunk the size of the meat and the pasta. And I was very impressed. That is good. I know some people who have a real problem with the sugars in fructose. Mm -hmm. is, is you have a words on that? High fructose corn syrup? Yeah. High fructose corn syrup actually took place of sucrose. I don't know if you remember, yeah. maybe 20 years ago, they yeah, would yeah. put sucrose in everything. Yeah. And it's not High good, right? Sucrose is not good because it's refined sugar, but high fructose corn syrup is more processed yeah. than sucrose and it's cheaper to make, so that's why they replace it yeah. and everything, and it's made from corn, yeah. and now the corn refiners want to change it to corn sugar, right. but I think mm -hmm. it was actually rejected, right. and it's right. high fructose corn syrup, which is yeah. not okay. good. Apart from eating what we do, what are the recommendations that you want to leave our parents with who have children who are a little overweight? Just some high points that you want to leave them with. I would say, well, with the eating, which is big, you want to switch the white bread and white rice for brown rice and whole grains and whole wheat pasta. Instead of serving juice, you want to give them the whole fruit so they get the fiber and all the nutrients. Take them for a walk if they live in a safe enough area to get some physical activity. And try and cook as much as they can at home and have the kids involved as well. Have There's them no reason why you can't do exercise at home. Oh, you can dance at, at home, yeah. turn on the music, okay. and enjoy your yeah. own. Yeah. Okay, on that note, let me thank both of our panelists for joining with Dr. Gums and myself on tonight's Healthy Television program. And most importantly, let me thank you, our viewers, for tuning in this evening. You will continue to be a most important part of our Healthy Television program. In the interim, if you have a medical question or need assistance, I encourage you to call our physician referral service by dialing 718-99 Bronx. That is 718-992-7669. Or you can refer to our website at bronxcare.org. Good night. See you next week when we'll be discussing women's health issues, including obesity. <laughs> <laughs>